So let us get started. My name is Anders, or if I pronounce it in my own language, Anders Göransson. I'm from Sweden. I am the general secretary of the Swedish Bible Society, but uh, today I am here in the capacity of one of the ambassadors for Thursdays in Black. And uh, we as ambassadors, we are very happy to, to see all of you who are participating in this first online Bible study in the series of, of Thursdays in Black Bible Studies. So good morning or good day, good afternoon or good night to, to all of us, wherever you are from the globe. Um, I have been assigned to, to work with these Bible studies together with Claudia Bandixen and Karen Georgia Thompson, and they are not able to be part of our uh, meeting today, but they greet us all. Um, this is a new opportunity, of course, that comes as um, maybe one of the few positive effects of the pandemic that we have learned a lot around these uh, digital resources. Um, our focus on, on the fight for a world without rape and violence within the Thursdays in Black uh, campaign is intimately connected to issues around gender, economics, and structural injustice. So we are therefore very, very uh, pleased to welcome uh, one of the black ambassadors, Amanda Kosi Mukwashi, who is the chief executive officer at Christian Aid, and who has written this Bible study and will lead us during this session. Uh, you are so welcome, Amanda, and thank you for making yourself available, uh, both as a per person, but also with your, with your knowledge and your thoughts around uh, the text from the book of Ruth. Um, but um, welcome to all of you. And I, I see that you, you right now in the chat uh, where you come from. And we, we have participants from, from uh, many parts of the globe, which is fantastic. Uh, we are both men and women. And that is also fantastic to see that we are in this uh, together. So... If I understood you correctly, Nikki, you wanted me also to open with a prayer. So please join in a prayer for this Bible study. Let us pray. Our loving God, we thank you for this opportunity to be together as sisters and brothers from your creation, from your, your world. Uh, wherever, wherever we come from, uh, we can be connected not only in, in your love, but also with the help of digital resources this day. We ask you to send us your Holy Spirit so that she may lead us uh, deeper into your word and enable us to understand more about who we are and understand how we can be together in this world as uh, ambassadors for your love, for justice and peace. And today we especially pray that you will lead Amanda as she leads us further in this uh, Bible study. Bless this um, uh, one and a half, two hours that we have together. And we ask this humbly in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Liberator. Amen. Amen. Thank you so very much, Amen. Anders. The rapid spread of the coronavirus in 2020 signaled a negative turn in the events of everyone across the globe and more so in our efforts to curb and contain the equally rampant pandemic of sexual and gender-based violence. Globally, 
Anecdotal reports indicated that women and girls were often obliged to stay at home full time with their abusers during the containment period. Cases of violence, abuse, cyber trafficking, female genital mutilation, incest, child marriage, rape, kidnappings were normative in many contexts, and women were rendered vulnerable subsequent to economic falls out, fallouts that have not yet been fully quantified. Throughout all this, the church has been actively supporting, processing, and responding in different ways. And the World Council of Churches has noted that the work of our member churches to alleviate the crisis stemming from the virus has been phenomenal. As we seek, each of us, to provide accompaniment to our global fellowship and beyond, the World Council of Churches Thursdays in Black Ambassadors have risen to the occasion, offering statements, denouncing violence, engendering hope and transformation to all humanity in addition to their daily work. This online Bible study is one such endeavor. Led by our conceptual team of theologians, Anders Joransson, Claudia Bendixson, and Karen Georgia Thompson, the Thursdays in Black ambassadors have extended to the world an invitation to partner with us and share in reflections on key themes pertinent to gender justice and overcoming sexual and gender-based violence. And so on August 9, our first of six studies, the initial set was posted to social media. Today, we have an opportunity to use one of the many platforms available to us to meet virtually and inviting you, our global partners, our members and our allies to join us as we explore the contextual relevance of God's word for such a time as this. We look forward to our engagement with our Thursdays in Black Ambassador, Ms. Amanda Kozi Mukweshi, Executive Director of Christian Aid, who leads us in this, our inaugural live Bible study. Ms. Kozi Mukweshi is passionate about eradicating injustice and inequalities socially and economically. She's a published author who has worked in both intergovernmental and non-governmental spaces. And Amanda brings with us to us a wealth of personal and professional experience to today's study. She has a master's degree in international economic law from the University of Warwick and a bachelor of laws degree from the University of Zambia. She therefore brings to us a somewhat legal, though humanitarian perspective on what it means to be an agent for difference against sexual and gender-based violence in her context, and of course, the wider world, which is the space where she operates. On behalf of the World Council of Churches, we thank you, Amanda, for being our first presenter for the online Bible study series in the live format. And to each of you who is gathered here, we bid you welcome. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Nicole, for that introduction. I, um, I was smiling when you were speaking uh, because uh, uh, it occurs to me that uh, many people in the Bible, when we read, um, have no uh, surnames, uh, we just know them as Adam, Abraham, Isaac, and their names um, tell us who they, they are, you know. And so I look forward to a time when um, our first names will be more than enough uh, by way of introduction. But thank you so much. Um, the, I want also to thank, uh, to thank you for the privilege to, to actually work on this Bible study. And um, even after I had written it, I have continued to think about it. In the last few weeks, uh, we've heard, uh, we've seen the situation in Afghanistan um, unfold. And uh, there is much that can be said about what has been happening in Afghanistan. But what I want to pull out this afternoon um, is uh, the fact that women and girls um, are going to be challenged in terms of being able to actually go back to school or to college. Uh, 
and uh, some of the work that we've been doing on women's rights uh, is now going to be limited and or curtailed. And that's not an accident, that's by design. I also just wanted to reflect um, that in Ethiopia, uh, in Tigray, where the, the conflict has been ongoing since last year in uh, November or December or thereabouts, what we saw was a situation where women and girls were violated, right? In the name of warfare and uh, we are talking about ourselves in terms of we live in the 21st century and yet what we saw in Tigray uh, when women and girls were violated uh, in the name of conflict is um, unacceptable to us. The last uh, thing that I just want to uh, flag up as I start this uh, Bible study is um, recently, I think it was last week um, or early this week, uh, we heard the, um, the police, the police watchdog in this country, the United Kingdom, refer to the fact that uh, violence against women is, um, is too much and is a serious issue that really should be approached in the same way that we approach um, terrorism, or at least it should be treated with the same importance and uh, significance as our fight against terrorism. These examples that I've given you are not examples in isolation. They're examples that you can go from country to country, community to community, continent to continent. And what you will find is that every day, women and girls sit at the bottom of the food chain um, and violence against women and girls is still very much something that is endemic and problematic in our society. Violence against the most vulnerable. And as Christians, surely this is not where we want to be because we know that uh, the teachings of Christ are very clear. He showed us by example that he was here to protect the most vulnerable and the most marginalized. And so I went to the book of Ruth. So this Bible study is based on the book of Ruth. And the book of Ruth is a very short uh, book in the Old Testament. It only has four chapters. And for many people, um, they go to the book of Ruth when um, I think, especially I think a lot of people who are getting married, they go to the book of Ruth because it's got that pledge, the famous pledge that Ruth makes to her mother-in-law, where she says, you know, my God will be your God, where you go, I will go, where you lodge, I will lodge, and so on. And so for a long time, um, that the book of Ruth really, I had never really explored it in its depth. And, um, but now that I have, each time I go back to it, I find something else, something new. And um, the Bible study is based on Ruth chapter one uh, from verses six uh, to 13. And um, just uh, a reminder to all of us what that story is about. Um, you have three women. Um, one is an Israelite, uh, that's uh, Naomi. Uh, she's married. And for whatever reason, they left, her and her husband left Israel and went to live in the land of Moab. And uh, while they lived there, they went there with their two sons. And while they were there, their two sons married two women, one called Ruth and the other one called Opa. And these women, Ruth and Opa, were women of Moab, from the Moabites. Um, fast forward, um, Naomi's husband dies, and Naomi's sons die. And Ruth and Opa do not have children. And so the three women are left without a man in the family um, and with very little. Things get really hard. And Naomi decided that she decides that she's going to go back home. And so she frees her daughters-in-law and says to them, please go back to your families. They'll look after you. And I'm going to go back. 
And after much persuasions and discussions, Opa decides, okay, I'll go back and she leaves. And Ruth makes that famous pledge that we all know of, which is in verse 16, where she says, no, I'm going to go with you and your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Now, the, the context, the times that we are they're living in, that this is happening, uh, Naomi knew very much how difficult and challenging it would be for Ruth to come back with her uh, to, to Israel. And they, 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 in this period, uh, structurally, uh, women um, are really, I think it's probably fair to say women are considered as very little, almost little to nothing. Because without a male counterpart, I mean, without a male relative or a male sponsor, then you have absolutely no standing. Now, uh, Ruth was not just a woman, but she was a woman of Moab, and she was going to Israel as a foreigner. Or maybe let me use the word that we use these days in current situations. She was a migrant. She would be a migrant from Moab to Israel. Uh, she was a widow. She was childless and they were poor, right? So all those um, factors contributed to a picture of Ruth and Naomi of having multiple um, disadvantages. And yet Ruth uh, was very committed that she was going to go with Naomi. I would encourage you to read the rest of the story, but the Bible study is really based on that. And what I wanted to reflect was that this is going back into the sixth or fifth um, centuries, but has the situation changed today for us? And what can we learn from Ruth in particular, but what can we also learn from Naomi? And what can we learn from, our relation, from their relationship that would help us um, navigate uh, the current challenges that we are experiencing. So has the situation really changed? Um, I'm hoping that uh, when we do break out, go into breakout groups, maybe you can think about some of those things. Because working for Christian Aid, traveling from the different, in different countries, looking at the programs that we have and the situations that we find a lot of women and girls in, I would be forgiven uh, for believing that actually things have not changed that much. No, things have changed a little bit, but we are not in a, in a position where we can say we are comfortable. I visited Zimbabwe once, I think about two years ago, and I met with um, uh, friends, well, with colleagues and a program that we were working on uh, with some of the people in the post apostolic movement. And uh, it was very disheartening, actually, um, because when I met with them, uh, we talked about early child marriages. We talked about girls not um, being allowed to go to school, or if they were allowed to go to school, they would be pulled out upon reaching puberty and um, prepared for marriage because they're ready for marriage. Now, you know, girls reach puberty at the age of 10, 11, some girls as young as nine. And yet early child marriages are ripe in, uh, in Zimbabwe, in parts of Zimbabwe. And uh, it's not acceptable um, generally. Um, however, it is allowed to happen and to fester. And it is allowed to happen in the name of religion. And that's what really, really challenged me, that some of these structural um, challenges and uh, exploitation or oppression are done in the name of religion. And surely that cannot be right. Uh, I went to uh, Bangladesh uh, and uh, Cox's Bazaar, where the refugee camps were. And, uh, even in that situation of being a woman who has been displaced by conflict, right? Um, there is no sanctuary within that displacement. 
to not only have you and your people and your community been displaced and you've had to leave everything behind, but even when you're put in a refugee camp, even within that, there is no sanctuary for, there's no safety for, for women and girls. Uh, and here I'm speaking from having the experience of having talked to people, to women uh, firsthand. And in Bangladesh, it was, uh, I spoke to uh, a woman who had two girls. Um, uh, her husband had, um, had, had, had died. And in the little temporary shelter that she was given for her and her daughters, she said to me, I sleep across the door. So because these are temporary shelters that just, they have no locks as such, uh, at least at the time when, we, when I visited, she said, I sleep across the door because if I don't sleep across the door, I'm afraid that whoever comes in um, will attack my daughters first. And so I would rather die first than to let my daughters be violated, right? And so I sleep across the door. And so these examples, are examples, like I said, that are existing in 2021, right? And maybe you might say that is um, uh, physical violence. But if we look at, uh, look at the economy, look at our economics, let's, talk, let's, let's look at climate change. When you look at climate change, um, I remember visiting uh, women in Ethiopia, uh, in South Omo, and um, the economic violence against them has made their life so difficult. So they are experiencing um, drought, right? More frequent droughts. And um, because of more frequent droughts, it means that the, the livestock are dying. It means that um, their crops are not, uh, they're not managing. It means that there is no water, right? There's water shortages. And uh, again, when you look at the hierarchy of who is bearing the burden of all this, it is women and it is girls. My point being that um, women and girls experience um, physical violence, they experience economic violence, they experience multiple types of violence against them. And that system is structural within our society, right? And we have to stop that. Um, like Ruth, the system that sh she and Naomi had to live in and overcome was a system that was structured. So it was the norm. It was structural that as a woman, you needed a man uh, in order for you to be respected or to be given audience or to have food, you know, without that, you were almost like cast away. And I believe that when Jesus came and when he walked the earth, um, he reached out to the most marginalized, whether it was the person with leprosy, whether it was the woman, the Samaritan woman, whether it was the woman that was being stoned, uh, all the people, the examples that he gave us were examples that said, uh, I want to break the, the structural barriers that mean that those, uh, that the people who are outcasts. So what Jesus was saying to us is that there are no outcasts in the kingdom of God. And if we are not able to break those boundaries, those barriers now, how can we think and dream of a heaven um, uh, without these, our brothers and sisters? Because Jesus said, I knocked and you did not open the door. I was hungry and you did not feed me. And so this is all part of that group. And so to finish, so that we can um, start the, the, the discussions, um, one thing that really struck me, and I want to leave you with this, the more I think about Ruth and Naomi, first of all, uh, the way Ruth managed to overcome, she was really supported by Naomi. Naomi, um, although she was elderly, uh, she was able to guide her. She was able to say, do this, don't do this. Uh, let's strategize together. And I believe that as um, not just women, but as brothers and sisters, 
as um, Thursdays in Black ambassadors, as the World Council of Churches, I think we need to lock arms. We need to put our heads together to see how can we, at the very least, religion, at least Christianity, must not be used as a justification in any way, form or shape for perpetuating violence against women, any form of violence against women. So how can we put our heads together? Because when we do that, then we are able to achieve what Naomi and Ruth achieved. The second bit is Ruth herself. Ruth was a migrant. She was a migrant, and yet um, she did not repay the Jews, the Israelites, with the hatred that they looked upon her with. Instead, she taught them kindness, she taught them loyalty, she taught them love. And she was rewarded by being placed in the genealogy of Christ. And so that is very challenging personally to me that, you know, how do we embody those virtues that Ruth had today when we look at migrants? I'm a migrant myself. So how do we um, how do I not get angry about issues, for example, of decolonization, issues of racism? How do I ensure that I can channel that anger and turn it into love, into kindness? And how do I ensure that that then has the impact that is needed the same way that Ruth did? My last comment is on verse 16, when Ruth says to Naomi, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. 17, where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more. Uh, also, if anything but death parts me from you. I want to ask us, Instead of looking at that as a really lovely, as a as lovely scripture for when people get married, what if that was a pledge that we were making to Christ? That God, I shall not be urged to leave you or to return from following you. For where you lead, I will go. Where you tell me to stay, I will stay. The people that you give me to be my people will be my people. How about if that pledge was the pledge that we actually need today, making it to Christ who gave everything for us? How would it look like? How would it change what we do? How would it change how we view migrants? How would we ch it change our relationship to the most vulnerable? Above all, how would it change the practices of our churches, our organized religions, our theology, when it comes to power and wealth and structural injustice. I think, let me stop there. I've used my 20 minutes and um, hand over to those who are facilitating, I think Anders, um, who are facilitating the group discussion. Or oh, is it Sarah? Thank you. Wow. Thank you so very much, Amanda. You, you, you have given us food for thought. What does it mean to have a male sponsor? What does it mean to be a migrant widow, especially in times of conflict, climate change, COVID, economic disparities? How far removed is Ruth, Orpha, and Naomi's context from the world today? And perhaps even more critically, the underlying question that you even named at the very end, what is the role of the church in addressing these injustices, these fears, and these threats? And then you chilled us with the stories and the examples you gave. And some might argue that this is anecdotal evidence, but part of the joy of contextualization of the Bible is recognizing the stories in the biblical narrative being reflected in our life story. Where is it assumed 
that women need men today. Hmm. And then you ask, as a migrant, as a black woman, as a black male, is it at all possible for us to not render evil for evil, injustice for injustice, despite what we're meeting today? Hmm. And then for those of us who think that we got off the hook as a triumphant church, Amanda insists, take Ruth's pledge as our pledge to Christ. And the only thing I would append, and I knew why you left it out, but I think I would say at the end, for you are my God. Just that you implied it, but I'm spelling it out for us. What does it mean? for us as church to read the story of Ruth in the 20th century, 21st century context. And I say 20th because some of us are coming from then into now. But what does it also mean to read this in the light of COVID-19, climate change, and all the wars and rumors of wars happening around us? Friends, we have been challenged, we have been educated, we have been even entertained in part, but more than that, we have been left with a lot of food for thought. As we chew, are there questions, are there points of clarification that we wish to invite Amanda to respond to before we go for 20 minutes in our breakout groups? Anyone? As we wait for folks to warm up and get past those momentary angsts, I guess I would invite you to help us to think in very practical ways. What are some of the ways in which the ordinary human can be an agent of change in such a time as this? Because I often hear folks saying, well, you know, those people over there are so far and I don't have the millions to throw at the solution. What, what are some practical ways, Amanda, that you think we could do this? Oh, I mean, it's, that is always the, the, the big question. Um, but, um, but I have seen, uh, for, so you've given an example of, of money in terms of giving money uh, for the work um, that, uh, that, that we do in terms of support. But I've seen people give um, very, very little. You know, um, it, it might be little to somebody who is very rich, right? Um, but to the person that is giving, they're giving with all their heart and or their you know, mind, and that's what they can afford. And so it is a lot uh, in terms of what uh, people are able to give. But this is not just about money though. Um, this is about, um, it's about action. So depending on which country you're living in, right? Um, for those who are living in places where you can influence legislation, for example, where you can raise your voice, um, I think we need to be speaking out, right? Um, and even if it means that we are speaking out to the church as an institution, because if our house is not clean, it's very difficult to come to equity with unclean hands, right? Um, we, we need to come to equity with clean hands. We need as, as, as a global church, right? We, we almost need to say, um, sorry if we've been asleep on the job, right? Um, sorry if we have allowed some of this injustice to take place in our own uh, places. If we've used um, uh, religion, uh, you know, uh, to perpetuate some of these, some of these things, right? Um, so, and I don't think we should be afraid. You know, I don't think we should be afraid. Let us take, um, there's so many, I could give you uh, almost from every book in the Bible, there's so many examples. You know, let's take the example of Esther, who was, when I think of Esther, I think of a woman who was really afraid, but she just said to herself, well, you know, I have to do this. And if I die, I die, right? But 
perhaps I've been placed here for such a time as this. So let's ask each other, have we been placed in this place at this time for such a time as this? Uh, the last thing that I want to say to your question is, um, again, let's look at examples. Um, we can look at examples in the Bible. Let's look at um, Jonah. He was told categorically, you go and do this. And Jonah ran. I mean, no. he, he, he ran, but God found him. And Jonah was happy to get back into the presence of God. So, um, but let me leave you with a challenge as a question to your question, uh, Nicole. Um, we see people from who are not necessarily believers, right? And some of them, I don't know, I can't make the judgment whether they're believers or not. But let's take Greta. She's a, Greta, she's, she's young. I think she, she was what, when she started her fight uh, for climate change, climate justice, 15, 16, 17, you know? Um, and she, she, she hasn't taken arms. She's not, but she's speaking. She's using her privilege to speak out. Right. And I could give you examples after example. Look at Vanessa uh, from Uganda. She's using the whatever little platform she has to speak out. And so I guess my answer is um, let's not be fearful and let's not think that we have to do everything, but let's do what is possible in whatever platform God has privileged us to be in. That is indeed the truth. Thank you so much, Amanda. Just before Uzuaku comes in, and I saw a comment in the chat from Beth Baskin and then Joan Capel, I want to note that two things crossed my mind. The widow's mate. If that widow had stopped to think of what her mate was worth, she might never have thrown it in the basket. And whether she was doing it as an act of defiance or an act of faith, love and obedience, the fact remains, she put it in and it made a difference. The other thought I want to share with us is, um, I do French on Duolingo from time to time and they have this section where they do podcasts. And there's a story about a girl from um, one of the Francophone African countries who she was from a very influential family and she lived a very sheltered life for the first part of her life. Except one day when she was going to school, she looked through the window and saw children on the road begging. And she started asking the obvious questions. Why are they begging and not in school? And her mom explained, it's not possible for them to do anything but beg, they don't have the wherewithal. And years later, when she went to Sorbonne in France, she found support and opened a school back home to ensure that there was educational possibilities for others. Each one, reach one. And I think that's what you're inviting us to do. Uzuako, Beth, and then Joan. Okay, thank you very much. Um... Um, Amanda, thank you for the responses you gave to uh, Nikki's question. On structural uh, um, exploitation, you did mention that. In the name of religion, I love the way you, I love the angle you um, came with it. And the fact that we all need to keep speaking and uh, not, um, not being afraid of the, the outcome of what we say as long as we are saying the right thing. I, I come from a tribe in Nigeria where um, uh, the churches just adopted this strange uh, practice where before now, if a widow dies, um, if, a, if, if, if a man dies, the widow is made to shave off her hair as a means of mourning the husband. Now, with a lot of advocacy, and uh, we saw that that is actually an, an uh, obnoxious acts and is infringing on the right of the woman. Now, what the church did was to some churches actually adopt that part of the tradition. And if a widow dies, if a man dies, the widow is made to shave. The same practice is going on, but this time around, she's made to shave in the church, by the church, 
in the church way, in quotes, but it's the same act, it's the same, it's the same uh, practice without uh, her, um, her concept. So what I don't, I, 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 I am still very deep, uh, saddened because we have not been able to find a way to come out of this because when you engage religious leaders, it's like a no-go, it's like a sacred area where you are not supposed to touch. Secondly, um, how can we, this is coming like a question, how can we help women to be independent of, of men, of in-laws, of um, everybody around them? Because have we, have we tried to find out why Ruth and Opa decided to go with their mother-in-law, where you, to, to go? What do we think is behind that? Could it be because Naomi was a fantastic woman or could it be because they were, hand, they were, they were vulnerable, they couldn't, they felt they cannot sustain living by themselves because they had nothing doing, because probably they depended on their husband 100% and now he's no more. How do I survive? without this my benefactor who had been there taking care of me. So how can we help women stand? Because it is still the same problem we have today. Women are ready to go through all kinds of um, abuse because they want to remain under a shelter. They want to remain under the help of a man or the relative. They want to remain under that protective um, ambience of the home. If they leave, if they, if they leave, they have nothing to, 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 to rely on, they have no job, they have no business, they have nothing. So how can we help women so that when this happens, they are, they are okay. They don't need to go with anybody. They don't need to be subjected to any kind of um, uh, practices that is um, against their own will and their own wish. Thank you very much. Um, if that question is a little bit understood, thank you. It is. Uh, Nicole, do you want me to take uh, the other two questions as well so that I yes, answer please. them at the same time before we break? Okay. Was Beth's a question? I think Beth's was a comment, but Beth, please, Beth Baskin, please come in with what you've said and also Joan Capel. Um, sorry, I don't have my camera on, but I. Uh, That's okay. I really appreciated just that sense of. Of, of pledging, and I've always understood that pledge that Ruth made, um, not in kind of the mushy wedding way it ends up in North America, but in, in, in much more a, a strength and a, a place of, of that I'm going to stand with you. And when you talk about it as terms of a pledge that the church needs to take, I think particularly for me in our we, in our Canadian and North American context, we as church people really need to find more strength to stand up against societal norms. And so I don't so much have a question as just I feel a little bit um, emboldened, I guess, on this morning to, to, to look at how do we help folks hear these words as words of strength and words um, that are calling us, as you say, to do something. Um, and I just really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Beth. Joan and Michael. Michael, I'm going to ask you to condense that question comment to a brief, but Joan and then Michael. Oh, great. Uh, great to see everyone. I, you know, when to, to put the um, scripture into uh, context in terms of how it can relate now, um, when you talked about follow uh, Ruth following her, her mother-in-law, right? Um, there have been many women uh, in recent history that uh, uh, we followed, right? We followed uh, Rosa Parks' lead when she refused to get into the back of the bus. We, we followed Harriet Tubman when she led us to freedom. So following a, a woman, I don't think has always has to be in a, a negative concept context because women are strength and in regard to what we as ordinary people can do um we certainly i remember back in the uh world war ii where women wrapped bandages we packed goods and and things there's always something to do we can pack the supplies that have been collected to send uh to the uh locations that need assistance 
uh, in the United States, we can petition our local uh, leaders and our government leaders, right, to uh, focus on things that are helpful. Right now, we have a situation going on in this country where uh, Haitian immigrants are being rounded up. It would appear that they're being rounded up like and chased like slaves and being you know, hauled back to Haiti. So what, I don't know what we can do uh, as a church to uh, accept to speak out of, about this and try to see if we can offer some aid or assistance to that. So that would be something that I think we'd have to petition our government uh, to take care of. Um, my roots are Haitian because my paternal grandfather was from Haiti. So my heart goes out to the people of Haiti and my heart goes out to the people and especially the women in Afghanistan who we don't know what's going to happen to them with what, you know, with what just, just took place. So I don't know, I think there's lots of work to do. Um, you know, as far as the church is concerned, there's, there are maybe doctrines and maybe some issues with what a church person can support that is complementary to what their religion uh, uh, allows them to support. So my thing is this, I've, I'm involved with a secular woman's uh, NGO secular organization. So we can step out and do things and support things that I might not be able to do within the context of my uh, uh, religious NGO. So I think wherever we can and wherever possible, we have to link up and we have to hook up with organizations and other people that are out there fighting and trying to, to, to get rid of this violence that's going on. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Shall I Michael, answer those? Oh. I think Michael's is either a question or a comment, but I'm going to ask Michael to make it very brief so that Amanda is able to answer before we go into our breakout groups. Okay, uh, I, it's, it wasn't really a question, but more something to think about. But change takes time. We grow up, we're all growing up in uh, many different cultures. And Jesus is calling us to live life in abundance. And we live in societies that deny that abundance to so many people in so many ways. And it's just how to make those changes. And I use the word incarnation. To how do we incarnate Jesus into our societies? So that with love and, and understanding, and we know that changes may take my life, my children's life, maybe generations, but how to, to, get, to, to, to get things going with humility and love without being too dogmatic, but definitely standing up and saying where we are is not the right place. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, all of you, uh, Michael, John, uh, Beth, and uh, Nicole and Ozwake. Um, let me just, I'll try and put all the, my responses in answering all the questions at the, at the, at the same time, kind of. But one of the things uh, that I wanted to start with is um, that the poverty is not an accident, right? Um, the vulnerability of, of, of people at the bottom of the pyramid, because it is a pyramid, is not, it's not an accident, right? Our economic systems have been developed in such a way that um, they, they, they feed the few, but at the expense of, of the millions. That's, that's how we sustain um, uh, our economic systems. Let me give an example, very specific example. So if you look at the issue of clim the climate crisis, if we believe the science, which I have to own up that I believe the science, right? Uh, if you take the science, uh, the countries that have been extracting fossil fuels from the earth over a period of time have used that to grow their wealth financially, right? But those countries who are now very rich, very wealthy, on the basis of that exploitation, it's not the only exploitation, there are several other elements of the exploitation that I'm not going to go into, but I'm using the climate change as an example. 
it has safeguarded the lifestyles of wealthier nations. And those lifestyles of wealthier nations are dependent on a continued exploitation of those resources and of people who are experiencing multiple disadvantages. Because somebody has to pay the price. And at the moment, the people who are paying the price are those in the poorest countries, right? So, and, and the church, we are part of that. We, we are not, if that is a, a, will, a will, a cycle that's going round, we're not outside of that. We are part of that cycle that is going round and round. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, who are we in that cycle, right? Are we the wealthier? Are we um, the most vulnerable? Are we both, right? And so what is our role and our function within that? If you take food systems, for example, the way we produce our food and what we eat and how we eat, you see the same narrative coming around. And so that narrative has to stop. But stopping that narrative means giving up power and giving up wealth. And the truth and the reality is that what we are seeing, we have the climate, uh, climate conference coming up in Glasgow in the UK next month. And what we are seeing uh, is that um, they, there is resistance to change our way of life. And um, it's going to take time. And in the, in the time that it's going to take, millions more will die, right? Millions more will die during that process. So um, the, the, there has to be a structural solution to it. There is something that I think, John, you said, um, John, you said um, about petitions. I think it's really important for us to look at if I live in the UK, I think I take it as my duty and my responsibility to petition, to write letters, to speak out, right? And to vote according to those who, to put people in office who I know are going to do something about it, right? That, that's where my power resides. So for each one of us, I think we have to look at that. Very, very quickly, um, in terms of, uh, you know, following women and, um, you know, women in leadership is not, um, I don't, I, I don't understand why the, why the world, um, especially the Christian, Christendom, why we think that somehow women in leadership is something that is, um, is, is, is new, right? Um, Deborah was a woman, as far as I'm concerned, she was wom a woman who, might I add, during the time of the judges, there was a lot of anarchy. There was a lot of violence. There was a lot of disobedience. And yet God, God himself, Jehovah God, thought it was important for him to rise a woman, Deborah, to lead Israel. And under her leadership, Israel enjoyed peace for 40 years. She didn't lead just women. She led men and women. She judged men and women. She was a prophetess for men and women. So, you know, um, if God himself believes that it is, or it's fine, it is right to have a woman in leadership, then if I'm in the church and my theology is that women should not be leading, I have to ask myself, who is feeding me that theology? Where am I getting it from? Last thing that I want to make, and I think um, there were uh, a question in terms of the examples that were given for Nigeria. Uh, I just want to say this. There's been a, conf we conflate as, uh, as people of faith, we conflate our own traditions and what scripture says, right? And we make those into one and the same thing. So, um, a nice non-contentious example is Christmas trees, right? Um, and celebrating Christmas. You know, there's nowhere in the Bible that it says we should be celebrating Christmas or that we should have Christmas trees, right? The whole idea of Christmas trees is, is, a, is, a, is a tradition that came from maybe a particular group of people, 
and it has slowly found itself into the practice of, of Christianity, right? Um, beating women and violence against women in such a way is not a biblical tradition that we should keep. It comes from individual uh, cultures or traditions. And uh, in some societies, then it is embedded and becomes part of, uh, uh, of our Christian tradition. We need to separate those two things. We need to uh, take sola scriptura, what is God's pure scripture, and say, this is what God says. This is what Jesus did. This is how he behaved. And we follow in his footsteps. And Jesus ab abhorred violence. He said no to people who picked up stones and would throw them, right? That's where we need to be. Uh, and so um, I hear you, uh, my sister, when you say, how can we help women to be independent? The only thing that I wanted to um, say, uh, add is, uh, I do not necessarily believe that, you know, um, this, it should be about men versus women or women versus men, right? Um, I think if we take a gendered approach to this, then what we need to be upholding is the fact that every human life is important before God. Jesus would have come to the cross just for me, right? Whether you like it or not, you know, whether I'm black or not, whether I'm abled or disabled, whatever, right? My life is important to Christ and that's why he went to the cross. And so even us as the church, we need to treat every life as critical and essential, as deserving of God's love, right? That's what God was telling Jonah, that yes, the Ninevites, they were evil, but I am gracious. I am, my grace is sufficient for them, right? And if they repent, I will be gracious, the same way that he was gracious to the thief on the cross. So I, I think that uh, the structural issues, right, need a structural solution. And I think the church has enough educated people in terms of intellectual understanding, in terms of economists, in terms of climatologists, enough to understand the science and what needs to be done and combine that. Um, with the word of God or ground it in the word of God in terms of uh, what he would have us do. So let me stop there because um, I don't want to sound like I'm preaching, but um, I can feel myself and hear myself getting really um, very passionate about this. But um, I hope that helps in terms of some of the answers. Thank you so much, Evangelist Reverend Dr. Professor Amanda. <laughs> And friends, no, I'm not being disrespectful. Amanda understands that I'm just teasing her. So at this time, we're going to break for 15 minutes in small groups. And during this time, in each of four, four groups, we have persons who have agreed to help to lead the conversations. Coming out of your breakout groups in the next 15 or so minutes, we invite you to identify one point that you would like to take back to the plenary when we reconvene, after which Amanda will give us her last word or words, and we will close in another 25 minutes. So wait for the sign and feel free to say yes when you're invited to join a breakout group. Okay, I try to, I think culturally, our women have got used to being downtrodden or kept down by the men, and they do not challenge the men. For example, we uh, organized, the church organized a meeting for uh, trying to educate women on rape and violence in Sri Lanka. And I was going around trying to encourage these women to come for this program. And one lady turned around and told me, oh, I don't need to be there. I have three sons. 
So it's only mothers who have daughters who have to be there, not me. And I had to educate her and tell her, look, mother, I also have three sons, but I need to know what's happening in this world and educate my sons not to do this because it is our sons, our fathers, our husbands who are going around doing this to abusing women. And if we don't find it important, how in the world can we expect the men to consider it important? Thank you so very much, Schubert and Alison. And we move to Anders. Thank you, Nikki. And it was indeed short, but it was a good conversation. We agree that not much has not changed. Um, and I would like if Ophiong, are you happy to just say what you, you said in the group about the situation in Nigeria briefly? Would that be okay? Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I said that in Nigeria, the cultural practices are well entrenched in the church. And uh, it's very difficult for leaders to change the narrative when women are concerned, because leaders also identify with certain cultural and traditional practices of their own um, tribes. You understand? So it's, it's going to be very, very difficult to separate, to separate it. And also there are some certain traditional and cultural practices that influenced the church right from inception. Like uh, where I come from, the, when the church came to Nigeria, it was the, the king of the land that used the men cult to cause people to be driven to church, forcing people, you know, to go to church. So it became very difficult, even as at the 80s, some people were still, um, those who were part of the cult and have titles, they still used to accompany them to church, you know, during burials. So, but such is no longer seen, you know, right now, but in the villages, I cannot be sure, I cannot tell you. I'm not sure, I don't know whether it's still going on. So we need to, it is the church leadership that need to learn to separate themselves so that the rest of the people, when I see that you are doing what is right, I'll be able to now follow suit to change. Thank you so much. What we came up as, as one suggestion is, is that we need education as a way of changing those uh, habits. That's that's all from us, Nikki. Thank you so very much, Anders. Jen. Yeah, thank you, Nikki. Um, um, uh, we discussed the uh, corporate powers, which includes the church, practice that contribute to continued inequalities and injustices against women. As, again, I emphasize the church as well. And we heard one example from the churches in Nigeria. And can I ask uh, Ulu Buni to share your case from Nigeria? Yes. <clears throat> thank you. Yes, uh, uh, thank you. What I'm, I said was that uh, the church has a role to change the current narrative to a positive one. Generally, the issue of uh, violence against women, uh, gender-based violence, etc., is very common, sometimes based on religious practices or cultural practices. And uh, it's high time we change all that and give women the opportunity. And one way is economic empowerment, education, when we do that, then we can expect to have a better society. Some churches are not, some of them, but very few. Like in the Church of the Lord, worldwide, 
uh, women are given opportunity to preach, to become bishops and even archbishops, to be part of what is going on in the church, to be educated, but that is not very common. And that is why I believe that the church still has a big role, a major role to play in changing the current narrative to a more positive one. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Jin. I think I'm frozen. Are you hearing me? Yes, I can hear you. I, okay. I have nothing to add what, uh, uh, what she said, what Ulubuni said, mentioned about the church's law to change, to transform the current narrative. That was a so powerful message that I heard. Indeed. And we heard education and women's leadership, strong leadership in the church. So that is, I have nothing to add more than. Thank you. Thank you, Jin. And Uzuako, please okay. let us observe that one minute because could Amanda right. still has to respond before we close. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Um, in my group though, it was, was very interesting, but very short, but we were able to come with the following. Uh, even though I will, I will call um, Joan, she has a story that also inspired us. Um, we saw uh, Ruth as a very peculiar personality and uh, we applauded her for getting along with her mother-in-law, which in most cases is not what is obtainable at this point. But most importantly, what we kept uh, our, our summary was the fact that it is incumbent upon women to do everything possible to support women. This was, uh, and we also emphasize that not just supporting women because they are women, but supporting women because they are capable and because they are able to deliver. It is not a war, it is not a fight between a man and a woman or the men and the women, no. It is the time for us to give our best. And then we looked at the question that- um, Okay, Juliana, it's either gonna be you or Sister Joan because okay. we have six then Joan, minutes to Joan, end. Joan will just tell us the story about the election, how women were against women. Joan, please just summary, summarize that. It's also very peculiar here. Where we come. I'll be very brief. My denomination yes. had uh, our general conference convening in July. We had several uh, connectional offices that were up for election. Uh, several very, very competent women were running. And guess what? No women won. And the demographics of the voting delegates overwhelmingly women okay so i think we we're gonna have to to maybe work on that we had several women that were giving themselves for the office of bishop no competent right we didn't get one all right so this okay. work to do to try to you know contain this 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 rampant patriarchy i don't know we have to do you know we need to, to, to fix our minds on that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joan and Uzuaku. Friends, the joy of the Bible study is that it continues in your own circles. But before we take it to our own circles, Amanda, you have four minutes for the last word before we close in prayer. In fact, I will invite you to do the benediction or the blessing of sorts in your four minute, five minute wrap up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, well, I mean, it's, I, I hope that you have found it um, uh, spiritually enriching. Uh, and I hope that you're going to go back and study this woman uh, a bit more. Um, I, I'm always amazed that, you know, uh, God um, chose her to be in that lineage of grace. So um, it, she's definitely worth uh, list, um, studying. Uh, a few thoughts just to take away uh, for me before we close. One is that um, uh, this is, this is a, a struggle that we must continue uh, both inside the church as well as outside. Um, I don't think, I think the church is trying, um, but I think there's a lot more to be done, right? And if I may suggest that um, it needs to happen at the leadership level. 
So whether it's the, 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 the preacher, the pastor of a church, the bishop, um, who, you know, whoever is leading, those who are holding um, positions of leadership in our church at different levels of our communities and our societies, it must start with them. They need to be bold and to stand up and to speak out, right? Uh, that's number one. Number two, as women, as those who are downtrodden, uh, who experience um, injustice and whose lived experiences, um, uh, you know, uh, we see uh, we as women, like Ruth and Naomi, we must um, stand together, right? And um, Ruth and Naomi did not just stand together. They used each other's strength, each other's uh, blessings, each other's um, uh, gifts, right? Uh, to, 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 to move forward, to move ahead. So we too must look at each other and say, you know, what strength does Amanda have and what strength does Claudia have? And together, how can we make sure that, you know, we are moving uh, to, uh, together? One sentence that I wanted to say is that we must refuse, whether we're men or women, um, uh, whatever, uh, uh, we, we, we are, we must refuse to be channels of oppression. And that's why we need to look at, you know, whatever we're being asked to do, is this, are we bearers of oppression? Um, instead, we must choose to be bearers of love and justice. And that's what Ruth and Naomi were. They were bearers of kindness, of love, of justice. Right. And so let me leave you with this. Um, you know, uh, climate change is here. Uh, we are seeing the fires. We are seeing the droughts. We are seeing the floods. We are seeing the displacements, millions. Uh, our leaders will come together in November. What will they be talking about? Um, this is a big step for us. And we must start with those small steps to actually call out for those things that we need for the justice that we want to see, right? For the resources that need to be uh, in there. Uh, I think the voice of the church leaders from across the divide is going to be critical. Uh, Micah, the prophet Micah tells us that he has shown you, O oh mortal, what doth the Lord require of you? To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God or with your God. So God has been very clear, and I think that we must just reflect on those things and start with ourselves, because I think the change has to start with you. It has to start with me, um, much as we expect others to do things. Me, Amanda, I have to be ready to make the changes in my life and take the steps that I need uh, to contribute. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we just want to thank you for this privilege of fellowship. We thank you, Lord, that uh, we have been in your presence. We know that when we come before your presence, Father, each one of us is blessed. No one that has an encounter with you, O oh Lord God, leaves with nothing and empty-handed. And so I pray and I thank you this afternoon and pray that each one of us is living with something that you have met us at our point of need. And so bless us now as we go our various ways. May we continue to raise and lift your name high so that we are not ashamed of you and you are not ashamed of us because Father, we belong to you by choice. In Jesus name, we give thanks, amen. Amen. And even as I take this opportunity to Amen. Offer apologies for the Deputy General Secretary, Professor Dr. Isabella Powell Piri, who was unavoidably absent for this inaugural study. I want to thank you all once again. I am sure that Anders and the team would be expressing their pleasure at what has done. Amanda, you did us proud for this starting study. Friends, if you are able, I invite you to turn your videos on so that we can have a group shot as we seek to go 
our separate ways. Thank you so very much for challenging us, for encouraging us, and for giving us something to start thank, our thank conversations. You. Thank you. And those of you who are on social media, we can continue the conversation even there. Indeed. Amen. Thank you all. Continue. Thank you so much.